Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on another um, Sphere Drones webinar. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes as we usually do um, for a couple more attendees to join us. Um, so just bear with us a couple more moments and we'll be right back. Thank you. All right, so I'd like to welcome you all today to a Sphere Drones webinar. Um, and today we're very excited to have um, the Emerson team with us um, to discuss the introduction to Emerson Hovermap, use cases and applications. And I'd like to welcome Peter Lawrence, Business Development Manager um, of Emerson, and Dr. Jeremy Safonia, um, Solution Manager and also Chief Pilot at Emerson. Um, my name is Paris Kokinos, Sphere Drones CEO, and I'd like to just allow um, Peter to just give a, a bit of a background of um, who he is and um, then hand that on to Dr. Jeremy. So, Peter. Thank you, Paris. Yes, as uh, Paris introduced me, I'm Peter Lawrence, Business Development Manager for Emerson. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working in the industry of new technology, uh, exposing it to the industry throughout uh, different parts of the world, predominantly Europe, Africa and Russia. and uh, working close to companies to um, promote and educate the industry on the latest technology that's coming out. Fantastic, thanks Peter. And um, Dr. Jeremy Spagna, do you want to give a bit more background about yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I've got a background in remote sensing and with uh, over the last six years, I've uh, been primarily focused on remote sensing applications with drones. Uh, uh, specifically using LIDAR and photogrammetry. Uh, my main responsibilities with Emerson include uh, uh, undertaking performance evaluations of our systems, so trying to understand what the capabilities and limitations of those systems are, uh, the development of workflows to help our clients produce uh, the deliverables that they're after, and uh, general problem solving, uh, advice, and support for our clients. Fantastic. Um, so thanks, Peter. Thanks, Dr. Jeremy. It's um, it's great to have you on board. And again, thank you, Emerson, for joining us on um, this webinar today. And I'm really excited to be able to present this um, to you all because it's quite an amazing um, product. It's Australian. It's um, it's it's a fantastic and unbelievable product. And it's great to see that I've got the team and the support um, from Emerson to be able to present this to you today. So as we do with all our webinars, um, we do ask a couple of poll questions at the at the very start just to get a feel for the audience that we have. So the first question here is, do you hold a remote pilot's license? And what you'll see is a, a poll question will pop up on the screen in front of you. If you guys can just get on and answer that question, that'll be um, fantastic. Um, I guess, yeah, like I said, the, the purpose of these polls is just to get an understanding of the audience that we do have. Um, throughout the webinar today, there'll be a lot of information that'll be um, being shared and if you do have any questions on the right hand side there's a tab um, where there's a question tab and you can ask questions. Um, there's already been a question this morning um, or today um, about whether this will be recorded and yes this will be a recorded webinar and will be available um, after the webinar to all people that did attend to be able to share around their organisation. So thank you very much for submitting the first poll. Um, We've got one last poll here um, before we get on um, with our duties today. So the first one is, uh, the second one here is, which would best describe the industry you're involved in? And, um, again, where the Emerson Hovermap does relate to a number of these industries. Um, so if you could just define um, the industry that you relate to, it'd be great to hear more about that. Um, 
Fantastic. Just wait for a couple more people to submit their um, poll questions. Um, and again, the questions tab is there on the right hand side. So if you do have any questions for either um, Peter or Dr. Jeremy, feel free to submit them there. Fantastic. So um, without further ado, the agenda for today is overview unique features and benefits of Hovermap, um, data capture and processing workflow, the use cases within the mining, energy, oil and gas, um, forestry, asset inspection and, and many more. Um, new valuable insights for productivity gains and increased safety with Hovermap. Um, and then insider knowledge on how world leading companies utilize Hovermap in their daily operations and some really exciting use cases there. Um, and then finally on the back end of um, today's um, webinar, we're gonna go through a substantial amount of Q and A. So really, really excited about um, answering all your questions that you may have. Just a little bit more about Speed Drones and who we are as an organization. Our, our purpose, um, of existence, you could say, is um, to be there as a, a customer support and extension of your drone program. And our objective is um, to help you through this ever evolving, um, this ever evolving industry that we sit in, being drones. And um, if you do require any help or assistance, please feel free to reach out. We can assist in sales, repairs and maintenance, training, consulting, rental, on-site support, and a new platform we call Cura. Um, which is specifically targeted at an enterprise platform that allows you to manage the complexities of a drone program. So moving into our service footprint, we've currently got offices in Sydney and Perth. Um, we've got a, a very diverse team from industrial designers to pilots, um, right the way through to um, solution engineers and, and graphic designers. Um, it's, it's an exciting team that we've got here at Sphere Drones. It's, we're very diverse and we're, we're well spread across the country to be able to support the enterprise customers that we do service. Um, I'll pass over to um, Peter, who will run through um, the slide deck that um, he has prepared. So just bear with me one second whilst I get um, this up and running. Peter, I'll hand that over to you. Thanks, Peter. Beautiful. We can just minimise that um, tab on the right hand side. That would be great. There we go. Sorry. Thank you for that. I'd like to take the time today for wherever you're located and uh, good morning and good evening and a good afternoon to run through Emerson Hover Map, the new technology that we've released into just a couple of years. As we said, our vision is to automate the collection of data and challenging GPS to modern environments. Uh, Emerson is a drone economy and data economics can be launched in November 2018. It originated out of the CSIRO, a government uh, research facility located in Brisbane. And we've since releasing and have gone across multiple applications uh, of several industries using the hover map. And certainly in those GPS challenged environments has been the core focus behind the development. And as you can see in the time frame that Emerson has been uh, in business, we have established a significant network throughout the globe itself. Uh, in the mining industry, we a lot of our core customers. And of course, um, we continue to work to expand our partnership with the distributors that we've uh, created. Our customer base, mining industry itself, and uh, you'll see a couple of interesting ones there with NASA JPL, who have uh, a hover map system for a couple of interesting applications, and even Melodyne, who supply uh, LIDAR systems, have one of our hover maps as a showcase um, using their system nuts, so we're very proud to be associated with Bellarmine in that relationship. So what is the Emerson on that product? It's a combination of working in multiple environments, uh, unique systems, nothing else like it in the world for its versatility. It uses one sensor to do a number of things, combining mapping and timing. Rather than just 
doing one specific, it's combining both those tasks to get the outcome. We're using LIDAR when it's mounted on a drone, a drone by collision avoidance. Enable the drone to fly without GPS using the LIDAR data and SLAM algorithm in really real time to estimate the position and velocity of the drone. This is used in advanced autonomy to allow the drone to self-navigate through complex environments. The SLAM, of course, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, simultaneous LIDAR and mapping, location and mapping. So Hubble is a SLAM-based mapping system. With SLAM, we don't need a high-end GPS or INS system up to the LIDAR. We're using the data generated for mapping and control. When we look at the key specifications, as it's shown, as mentioned before, we're using the Validine Puck, which is light, and uh, part of the uh, Validine Automated Program Partnership. As it says there, 300,000 points per second is captured, 100 metres of range, uh, dual return, first and second return and returns intensity value as well. Our field of view, 300 by 60 by 360 degrees. Um, we've achieved this uh, through constantly rotating uh, the Velodyne puck uh, to generate mapping in all directions. This is also important for drone autonomy, allowing it to see in all directions and keep, it, keep itself safe. Data is stored on board up to 12 hours of information. Uh, mapping can be processed, which is on board the drone. Uh, we connect to Hover Map through a Wi Fi link, and when it's on a drone, via the DGI Light Bridge for binding control of certain features and receive back from the, uh, feedback from the system. The wide input voltage provides flexibility of power sources and tapping power from the drone. Weight, of course, is a critical for the drone uh, optimise, keeping it light for flight times, size of the drone, plus added comfort when using it in a handheld application. Compact in its design. So with a SAM based system, and it's not necessarily going into the specific details associated with our SAM algorithm is working, but um, we're using the latest SAM implementation from CSRO which is world renowned for robust SLAM algorithms. Um, so, so in that sense, the world best SLAM solution is what we're uh, buying each time one of our units. Uh, the feedback that we receive from customers about the SLAM compared to other systems is the positive quality of the SLAM results um, that come from the Hover Map itself, uh, greater SLAM images and mapping data in comparison to others. But unique features, it uh, doesn't matter, you can start and stop while you're in motion. So compared to other systems requiring you to be still, uh, we can initialize the scanning at any particular time during movement. And that allows you just to be, because um, whilst you're airborne on the drone itself, you can initialize the mapping there to avoid having to map unnecessary areas. GPS data can be logged from the drone um, GPS system to geo-reference point cloud, uh, the world, world coordinate um, frame. Post-processing into formats that can be used in other third-party tools, uh, typically the uh, ISZ file. With the per point attributes, we have a wider, uh, the LIDAR produces intensity values. Uh, we add range, every point has range from the scanner, very useful for cleaning up the point cloud as the noise is a function of range. Uh, you can keep the closer points to clean up the noise in the point cloud itself. And of course we have time, return number and ring number. 
for economy, uh, as mentioned, it provides collision avoidance. What we call uh, our mesh, virtual elliptical shield, like a virtual bubble that is created around uh, the hover mountain drone that can be dynamically adjusted based on drone speed and direction. The size of the shield can be changed during flight, depending on how close you want to get to a structure. GPS to night flight provides position, hold, velocity control, and waypoint navigation. Uh, very similar to the P mode on the DJI drones, which makes it safe and stable to fly in GPS denied environments. Currently, the autonomy functions are compatible with the DJI, own DJI autopilot, though we are adapting to the PX4, which will enable hover map to provide autonomy in other drone models as well. Here we can see the hover map attached to the DJI M210 drone. As you can see, it's well balanced, compact system on that particular flight. And the simplicity of integration into that smaller drone. Here it is on the DJI M600. The M600 provides a larger platform uh, for carrying additional sensing equipment if you wish to add it. Flight times, we see approximately. to 20 minutes on the M210, depending on uh, the type of battery being used, and 35 to 60 seconds is essentially what is being achieved. Um, compared to the GPS and IMS systems, it's easy and quick to, to use. There's no waiting for GPS signal to be required, no special calibration flights like the figure eights that need to be formed. We can use all the flights, flyable flight segments uh, to gather good data and not rely on um, having to fly in parallel formations to get good data. Apparently I'm having a bit of an audio issue. I'll just try and rectify that just one moment. Okay, so hopefully we can hear me okay now. Just a mute. Um, we connect via our quick release system on the hover map to the drone itself. We connect that from the drone. That's what the A3 or that pilot provide autonomous functions. The push of a single button on the hover map to start the process up and flying, as it said, in around 60 seconds. The processing workflow, once the data has been captured, we can go through the simple process of connecting a USB stick to the hover map, data downloaded directly into the USB, and through the, uh, our application itself, um, you just it's a drag and drop application. Um, you can generate the point cloud within approximately twice the time uh, required uh, compared to the scan time. So it's a 15 minute scan, they're around about 30 minutes of scan uh, processing time to generate the point cloud uh, format in a 3D format. One of the features, of course, um, our software is automatic slam based merging. So, as you can see from the image here, separate scans um, have been merged into one single scan, providing scans have a little bit of overlap, 
can be merged into the unknown rigid way. The software will optimize the fit between the data sets. The image that you see is of a statue uh, mapped by four flights and a walking scan below. So hover map was originally initiated for working in GPS environments, uh, accessed through a drone that adapts itself into a number of other uh, versatile applications. We take it off the drone through our simple uh, universal mounting tape with a quick connect system. Um, the handheld, as you can see there, just a hand grip attached to it to be walking around attached to the backpack. And then also we have the mount brackets for the uh, M210 and M600 and vehicle mounted as you can see as well. We have two types of vehicle mounts. One is a suction cup and the other is magnetic. And they're both uh, vibration isolated. So as we spoke, our hover map is uh, working in the GPS denied environments. It was originally focused towards mining. We have two variants of autonomy. AR1 is uh, involved with the human in the loop providing control of the drone and the autonomy level itself is to provide collision avoidance at a safe, keeping the safe distance based on the shield that's been set. If you take your hands off the control for the drone, the ho it will just simply hover in a fixed position, giving a very safe and stable flight with the drone in line of sight. The system itself has been Field operation with our customers for over two and a half years. And uh, it's been here we see the, the UR. So, when using a Tommy Level 1, this is the interface. It's an Android app using the DGI SDK. We put all the standard DGI controls included and, uh, and presents our information as well, in addition to that. On the screen there, you'll see the uh, positioning the proximity warning information shown in a number of quadrants, front to back, left to right, up and down. Um, displays the distance from the objects, so displaying the distance from the objects, uh, the information that you're seeing. Uh, and it's there for information purposes only, because the autonomy level one system is providing that collision avoidance um, protection that you need. And of course, that distance we said before can be changed as well, too, if you want to get closer to objects. The app's capable of uh, streaming live camera view from the drone. So if you have a gimbal mounted to the drone, this can be streamed through light bridge with the obstacle proximity information overlaid. We also have the moving map as well. So you can see where you are from the top down. The next level of autonomy we're focused on is autonomy level two. And which allows us to fly the drone beyond visual line of sight without GPS using the standard RC transmitter to arm the drone and then take control off the drone via a, a tablet application. Uh, it's a simple tapping off the tablet to take off. Then by setting waypoints, you can control which direction you want the, uh, the drone to go. There are several waypoints that are used uh, and a, stream, uh, a point cloud that is streamed back to the tablet to visualize the environment that it's mapping at the time. You can set a waypoint off into the distance of several hundred meters. The system will keep exploring 
to try and reach that waypoint without any input from the user. Even if it loses communication, it will keep going until it's achieved the waypoint. If it can't achieve it, it will time out and fly back safely. Automatic return home is critical uh, to know when it needs to return. If it can't achieve the mission that's been signed, or if the batteries become critically low. And here we see an image of the data that's being streamed back to the tablet, showing the tail point, and also there's a couple of different waypoints that have been set there for it to achieve. So with that information, we just want to step into, I guess, uh, one of the things we see is that you know, there are several use cases for hover map. And since it's been released into industry, a number of those applications is continuously continuing to grow. Our focus is on developing the use cases where we see the highest applications across the, the industry itself to focus on um, delivering information and getting the best results in that specific application. So I'm going to touch on most of these uh, applications today in the different industries just to share a bit of the information, the data that's been captured to date so far. And of course, as we said before, um, underground mining was the initi initiated the core application of the drone hover map. Some of the other areas that step, step into it is uh, survey inspection, delivering as built complex 3D data intelligence. GPS to other environments. So an underground mining. Hey Peter, sorry to sorry to interrupt there, mate. Um, I was just wondering if we could probably get um, Jeremy to talk a little bit more to the slides whilst you kind of get your internet connection um, up to scratch. Um, just because it's pretty poor and there's been a couple of people raised to the fact that the audio is pretty shocking. So. Um, there is an element um, to yeah. There is an element to dial into the presentation. I'll call you after. Um, I'll call you now on your mobile to get that sort of. But I'll, I'll allow Jeremy to talk to those slides now. Jeremy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here and um, happy to uh, do my best. I, I I've never seen this slide deck, so I'm not sure what the next slide is going to be. So I'll do my best to. Uh, to, to talk to each slide. Uh, that being said, I also don't have the slide deck with me, so uh, I'll have to have Peter uh, advance uh, the slides for me. Yeah, but uh, given the audio situation, I reckon uh, this is a, a decent compromise and we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, so thank you very much, Peter, for, for um, uh, taking us this far. Uh, I think that he's done a good job of showing some of the um, system capabilities and, and the um, kind of the structure behind uh, how we are implementing Hovermap from a mounting practice all the way down to the um, the app. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed that, but the app itself is actually modeled on DJI's app. And um, we did that on purpose because uh, obviously DJI dominates space and there's a lot of existing drone pilots who are familiar with that layout. So uh, the ability for uh, uh, the current DJI users to in start working with Hovermap is, is very straightforward. Um, so as Peter mentioned earlier, uh, there's a wide variety of different uh, uh, commercial market space where uh, drones are being used and, and Hovermap can play a role in and in and across many of them. Uh, given its versatility, it is able to um, be deployed in specific cases, but also uh, across an industry. So if, for example, in underground mining. So uh, I, the next slides will uh, we'll be able to discuss that a bit further. So, uh, in underground mining cases, uh, Hovermap has been successfully deployed across uh, a multitude of the uh, different aspects of individual mines. And uh, most commonly, uh, we're imaging stokes, but also uh, vent shafts are, are very popular and, and ore passes are in high demand. Uh, draw points um, and monitoring drives also. Uh, the occasional tipple inspection 
Uh, old workings are a challenge for us because, uh, well, they're challenging in the first place because they're hard to get into and you don't know what's there. But that's where this uh, next level of autonomy comes in. And that uh, self-exploration type of feature where it can map that environment without the person being able to see it. Uh, so traditionally, uh, stope mapping uh, has been conducted with CMS or cavity uh, monitoring systems. Uh, generally speaking, because you're so close to the open hole, uh, they're, they're considered relatively hazardous. Uh, they're about 20, 25 minutes uh, to set up and execute. So they are somewhat time consuming, at least relatively speaking. Um, access issues so there's usually one uh, particular point of entry so that can limit how well they can visualize stope areas and that uh, re can result in uh, poor data including shadowing uh, relatively low point density and uneven point densities so you'll have high concentrations of points right at the head of the cms and then very sparse uh, information uh, further up the stope Yeah, so uh, when we are uh, connected to the drone, uh, we are able to image the stopes in a, in a revolutionary way because we can fly in them. And we are uh, able to do that faster, especially on multi-level stopes, because uh, we don't have to necessarily go to each level. So we can do the entire stope within 20 minutes instead of 20 minutes per setup. Uh, we, we do achieve better da data in terms of coverage and, and point cloud density because we are able to fly inside and up and down and around the stope, so we have minimized shadowing. And uh, at that uh, point cloud resolution of um, you know up up to 300,000 points per second, uh, the resolution inside is is pretty amazing. Um, there are some cost of savings with that associated with the time, the equipment, and the quality of the data, and the and more importantly, the decisions that are made based on that data. And safer. I mean, we don't have to be um, right up on the bund. We can be further back and let the drone go in and do the higher risk work. So this is just a, a, a simple image of uh, DJ, the, the hover map on DJI M210 flying into a, a stope, and uh, you can see it descending in this image here. And this is the resultant point cloud. So you can see we didn't have to go in on all three levels on this 90 meter vertical stope. We only flew in from the top, but because we were able to fly all the way down towards the bottom, we could capture uh, the entire stope in one from one access point instead of having to go to all three levels. Generally speaking, uh, the resolution that we have is uh, is almost uh, it's not uh, it's it's higher resolution than what people are accustomed to. So in this case, we can always downsample that. But when we do have that higher resolution, then other people that have other questions can get involved. So that, for example, the geotext can become interested because we can see the brake lines uh, and faults and hang ups and um, over breaks and under breaks and other features in the geology. So for a uh, normal mind modeling, we can downsample the data, but uh, for other questions, we can start to begin to ask uh, some new and interesting questions that can add value to what Hovermap is doing. So this is a quote from uh, our, our, our close colleagues in Canada. Um, they were saying that uh, to, for this particular stove, it would uh, normally take in about two hours to complete with the CMS. And in this case, uh, they achieved that result using only a single five minute Hovermap survey flight. Uh, this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the same stope. Uh, on the left, you'll see that the, it was scanned with the CMS, and on the right is hover map. And on the left, you can see that high concentration of points down the, towards the bottom where the CMS was uh, introduced into the stope, and then it becomes very sparse. There's still a general outline, and that's been acceptable for the last 20 years. Uh, th th there's nothing wrong with that. However, uh, now, 20 years later, we have new technology, and you can see the difference. Uh, we have that point high, high point cloud resolution throughout the entire stove. So that uh, makes it a, a far more accurate measurement of the, uh, of the cavity. In this case, that little line that you can see in there is actually the flight path that was taken by the, by the, by the aircraft. And that's uh, often useful in understanding where we were able to penetrate into and maybe why we were able to, uh, to, to get good images in some parts, but shadows in others. And then we can use that to better plan uh, for, for, for subsequent flights. Uh, in this case, this was a level two flight and uh, you can see it was beyond visual line of sight for the, for the operators down at the bottom. Uh, this is a, uh, a 
these are some high resolution imagery showing some of the geotechnical um, uh, features of these cavities. Uh, previously, this kind of resolution was, was not achievable. So this is a beyond line of sight flight. Uh, this is a very large open stope, um, probably 50 or 60 meters from floor to ceiling. If you just go back one, Peter. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see again the, the flight line and how it was able to fly around and autonomously navigate that space. We can actually still pick up all the, um, from the blast, there's all the um, um, uh, wires and cables and things uh, that were used for support. Uh, they're, they're now hanging down and the drone can see those, our hub map can see those as well and, and navigate around them safely and then return back into the drive. Okay, thanks, Peter. Okay, so this is a, uh, a ventilation shaft uh, from our partners in South Africa, Dwika, and in this case, they would have lowered hub map down on a cable. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, the flying is, is excellent, but if you don't need to fly, we don't. Incur, um, it's we will always try to minimize risk, so it's quite easy just to mount hover map on a cable and lower it slowly to the bottom of the vent rise, and we can see um, under break, over break, and uh, if there's um, any geolo uh, geotechnical issues uh, with the vent. And that's very useful for monitoring the condition of these things. And this, this is a, a, a different example, but a similar application. This is a vent rise, was lowered down on a cable. And when they got to the bottom and they saw this blowout, uh, a, a multi-million dollar decision was made to abandon that vent because there was no way to, to resolve this issue. So they abandoned that vent and started another one. And uh, within a, a 10 minute scan, they were making a multi-million dollar decision. So. Uh, otherwise, this data was uh, previously un un unobtainable. Uh, again, this is uh, the, the same vent rise, but it was from the from the viewpoint of the blowout looking back up to the vent. Uh, again, uh, I'll probably ramble on about this a lot, but the, the versatility of Hover Map is was one of my favorite components of it. So uh, its flying cap capabilities on a drone are, are what gets a lot of everybody's attention, but in this case. Um, it's very easy to start it up and uh, walk with it in a handheld use case. So uh, this is a, a kind of a laydown area with the Grizzly over an ore pass, and we can uh, then image those areas and manage that space in, in the 3D model. We can also mount it to vehicles, and in this case, uh, it's uh, mounted with a suction cup mount. Uh, some people laugh at the suction cup because uh, it doesn't seem very robust, but uh, that particular suction cup is rated to 20 kilos, and hub map weighs less than two, so it's very secure. We've tested it in all kinds of different environments, and one of the benefits of a suction cup mount is that uh, in, in, in a lot of mines, uh, the light vehicle availability is limited, so if you had a dedicated vehicle for survey, then that's, that's fine, but if you don't have a dedicated vehicle, then this is easily transferable from one vehicle to another. Uh, we do also have more rigid mounts for a uh, more permanent type of vehicle solution. And uh, through drives, um, you know, on the vehicle mounts, we're, uh, we're able to map uh, the drive layout and help start construct the entire mine model. This is probably about uh, five or 10 minutes worth of driving. So in addition to uh, the underground mining space, uh, there's plenty of civil engineering that is also underground. Uh, this is a ventilation shaft in Sweden uh, where uh, they're um, making a six lane highway underground. And so they have to ventilate those uh, areas as well. And uh, we were here demonstrating to their national authority uh, the benefits of Hoverman with AMSCO, our partners there in Sweden. So this is a, a mesh model that uh, I created out of that that flight data, and uh, yeah, we can actually see the difference in texture on the, between the top half and, and kind of this bottom part of the vent, and that's because the top half has been shot created already and the bottom half has not. Uh, just some more examples of tunnel images. I believe this one is from um, a tunnel uh, in Melbourne. Uh, 
So uh, in addition to the underground mining, uh, there's uh, surface mining applications. And if you are an underground mine, then that there's often surface uh, elements to your work as well. And that is a value add proposition that HubMap offers because the same uh, instrument that is used to monitor your stoves can come up to the surface and very quickly and easily monitor your stockpiles. Uh, also, if you have any benches that need to be monitored or um, other infrastructure, uh, uh, such as conveyor belts, crushers, and, and infrastructure like that. Uh, Hovermap is, is not only creating these point clouds like in this image here, but it's also with that, that shield, it's actually keeping the drone from hitting that infrastructure. So in many cases, there might be a requirement to have the shield at a set distance, say 10 meters, and Hovermap will not let the drone go within that distance, keeping the infrastructure safe, meaning that this infrastructure does not have to be shut down and inspected if uh, there was an impact from the drone. Uh, so the cost uh, implications of that would be significant in many cases. So that, that safety feature there is, is really a, a, an important one. And uh, in, in addition to obtaining uh, the point cloud imagery, uh, we can also mount cameras and obtain a more traditional uh, photograph and video assessment and for for that sort of um, investigation. Uh, this is a conveyor belt uh, out in Western Australia um, loading up iron ore into a train. And in this case, the safety officer uh, asked me how I would guarantee that the drone wouldn't be within 10 meters of the infrastructure. I showed him how the shield worked. He said, let's get on with it. So um, we were able to image this quite nicely. You can actually see on the stockpile there that um, there were some rocks coming off the conveyor belt. That was that conveyor was actually still in operation. So um, this is a, a stockpile assessment that we conducted also out in Western Australia. Uh, very, very quick and easy to just delineate the boundary of the stockpile. Um, the workflow on this is quite simple and uh, fairly accurate uh, volume estimations of certainly much more so than than traditional um, uh, shooting in a, a few points and or using GPS uh, rovers, et cetera. Uh, photogrammetry is also uh, useful in this type of application. However, the processing time can also be prohibitive. Whereas if you already have the HoverMap system for other applications, you might as well, like I said before, pick up your stockpiles whilst, you're, whilst you have the equipment. This is a, an oversized stockpile. So this is a, uh, an open pit mine, uh, iron ore, and they, didn't have a, they had a blast that didn't go well. And so, uh, they had all these oversized um, um, elements into their, into their stockpile that they couldn't send through the crusher. So we were able to image that and also with some third-party software run a, a fractional size analysis on that and then they could better manage that with that information. Uh, this is a ROM pad. So uh, the materials moved to the top and then uh, pushed into the crusher and then conveyed over to the other side. This this image here is um, an indoor uh, buffer, they called it. It's uh, from a diamond mine in, in uh, South Africa. And uh, again, volume calculations inside here can change daily because they're they're constantly feeding into and drawing from this, this facility. Uh, you can see the above uh, infrastructure as well. And in this case, um, this is definitely a GPS denied environment. Would be very tricky to fly a drone in here with, without hover map attached and that collision avoidance capability and that, that position hold and stability of flight made it very easy. Um, again, volume calculations in this kind of environment are dynamic and uh, flights can be done um, you know, daily, hourly as, as needed because uh, they're very quick to obtain and also uh, very easy to process. So terrain mapping, I think that drones in themselves have uh, started to revolutionize this space. Uh, in this case, we can see the, the 12 apostles down on the coast of Victoria. And uh, to image something like this, uh, traditionally would have required a helicopter, you know, manned aircraft, and it would be very cost, uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, to do so with a terrestrial laser scanner, again, very difficult, challenging, especially to get around the other side of that pillar. But with a drone, we could sit up on the table that's there on the left and then fly up and down this rock face and, and image it accurately. Uh, that, is helping managers understand what the erosional rate is on this coast, which is um, a very famous and, and um, very important part of Australia's tourism industry. 
So I've, uh, I've not seen this particular image before, but it, it looks like uh, quite a large uh, hole in the ground. And uh, yeah, we can see the detail uh, of the, uh, oh, it's a cave system. Yeah, so we were able to fly down into the cave system. And uh, again, these vertical faces and down inside of this cavern, uh, very difficult to get with a like a terrestrial laser scanner um, or other types of imaging techniques. Uh, absolutely not going to fly manned aircraft into this sort of space, and even walking around would be um, would potentially be risky in requiring um, harnesses and all kinds of other safety gear. You could send the drone in, obtain the data that you're after, and get out, and you're you're done in less than ten minutes. So this is the uh, CSIRO facility where um, Emicent and Hovermap were born. Uh, as Peter mentioned, we spun out of this government uh, research out of their robotics division. Um, and uh, this is a, a great image that I collected um, that actually uh, is a com combination of five different flights. And it shows the, uh, the capabilities of merging multiple uh, data sets into a single unified data set. Uh, it, because I wanted to get it into high definition, high detail, I was flying them in smaller flights that were lower to the ground, but I knew that I could bring them back into a single high resolution image. So in addition to um, civil and mining applications, um, and some of the mapping that we've covered. Uh, the energy sector is also quite interested and is, uh, has adopted hover maps for their use. In this case, we can see a, um, a sub electrical substation and uh, some of the detail that we're able to pick up in flying around these types of assets. Yeah, so this is from a hydroelectric power station. And in this one image, we can see so many different things that we obtained in a single flight. We've got the, the transformer tower in the back. We've got the substation. We've got the hydroelectric um, a generator facility down in the front and their offices and even a telecom tower with some, uh, looks like some microwave dishes and other assets on there. But the fine detail and that uh, ability to pick up on those fine fine uh, cables, et cetera, are because of uh, uh, the work that our team does in-house uh, after we receive a Validine to, 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 to calibrate it. And it's also the quality of our SLAM algorithm uh, to, to generate the, uh, very uh, clear imagery from a Validine laser and uh, obtain uh, high resolution in a very uh, short amount of time. Mm -hmm. another substation and um, I know that we're running short on time so we can just uh, kind of uh, go through these very quickly Peter and just a just a reminder for everyone if you do have any questions um, to ask the Emerson team feel free to submit them there on the right hand side we will be attending to them at the end of the uh, session so this would be a uh, plan view of uh, some some substation assets Uh, this is inside of one of the hydroelectric uh, generation facilities. Uh, we flew inside of this building and uh, were able to, to uh, the facility was operating as we were going. Uh, same facility, just a different view. Uh, this is uh, where the water is uh, coming down the side of the mountain into the, uh, into the um, generator building. Uh, that kind of stuff is useful for corridor mapping as well. So making sure that uh, the vegetation is not encroaching on the asset. This is one of the dams that's holding back the water at the uh, hydro facility. It's interesting because uh, the water does not return the light, generally speaking. So we can see that the back of the dam is black because that's full of water. And looking at the through intensity, we can actually see some variation in the concrete and that can help with uh, uh, inspection and uh, condition assessment. This is a cross-section view of that same uh, dam. And uh, some um, 
Power transmission lines, again, uh, vegetation encroachment management is an important aspect to these types of uh, infrastructure. So monitoring that vegetation is, is possible with this type of technology. Again, some more transform uh, high voltage transformation uh, trans transition lines. Yeah, so oil and gas is also a, um, a market that has expressed interest for uh, hover, use of hover map, um, particularly in um, managing uh, assets, managing space on assets, and also in decommissioning uh, or needing to refurbish older assets. Some storage tank facilities. This uh, storage facility is going to an offshore um, jetty uh, for fueling or delivering to that facility. Uh, so inside of these tanks is something that we can also achieve because uh, we're able to work without GPS. So in this case, some very high detail on the inside of this. And uh, they were actually able to take this data and reverse engineer the design. Uh, because the the tank itself is quite old, so they they didn't have the plan, so they could use this information for reverse engineering this tank. So this is a um, offshore uh, drill and production platform uh, that we were able to scan whilst in Norway last year. We did this through a walking scan and a flight. Uh, we weren't only able to access the, uh, the platform uh, for about an hour while the, uh, while the guys that were working on it were at lunch. So we had an hour to, to acquire this, this data set. Some uh, gas train asset. Again, for, for planning, uh, you know, additions to this, you can see they were in limited space there. This is a cooling facility. You can see the fan and the, on the uh, fourth one up is not, not operating because it's uh, static. And construction in urban environments, this is a quite, quite a big um, application uh, for Hovermap, uh, particularly in Japan. I know that they've done a lot of work in this space. So, um, you know, at the as built, as the floors are going up, um, large infrastructure, uh, here we can see that uh, this building is still under construction with the cranes mounted to the top. And uh, we can image the inside and outside uh, through walking scans and flights to get a, a very complete picture of the asset. Yeah, so this is a, a walking scan of the inside of an interior and the, 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 the ceiling's been removed so that we can see down inside of it. So this is us uh, flying inside of uh, these types of environments, and this is a particularly useful if, um, if for some reason that it was not safe to send uh, people through that environment. This is an elevator shaft. So in this case, we attached a uh, hover map using our magnet mounts to the uh, top of the elevator and then just pushed all the buttons and rode it up and rode the elevator back down. And uh, you know, no one's seen the inside of this shaft for the last 20 years, and now they have a, a better picture of that environment. This is a metro station in Germany, and this is done with a walking scan. So you can see that the surface was walked and then it um, underneath into the station and, and then back out, and a cross-section view of both, both uh, surface and underground. Uh, same area. Again, just some examples of some walking scans and the, how much data that can be achieved just through walking. Yeah, uh, obviously, if we wanted to get to the tops of these buildings, uh, a flight would be better. But uh, in this case, uh, you know, to get uh, that much data within probably a 20 minute walk is, is pretty incredible.
So again, water doesn't return uh, the LIDAR. It's because it's a, an infrared laser. So it's, um, that can actually help us delineate uh, water levels. And uh, we've even used it to, to estimate the load on barges because of where they are and where their water line is. And you know, the more load that they have, the, the deeper than the water they'll be. So the absence of data can also be quite useful. This is uh, Chicago River. This is uh, collected by Stefan Frabar, our, our CEO, and uh, he was at the, Vela, um, uh, the Velodyne booth uh, at, uh, in Las Vegas this year, and uh, quite an interesting scene to be able to scan and walk around Las Vegas. Just some more examples of being able to uh, scan uh, on multiple levels, the ground all the way up to the roof and get a very uh, detailed and complete picture within a very short amount of time. The fact that we can even read the UPS store with the intensity values, um, I think speaks highly of the quality of the point cloud that we're able to obtain, which is not easy to do using a, a mobile, small, lightweight mobile laser scanner. Again, just some interiors, um, and this is, again, another storage facility walking in and around that asset. And you, the green line here is the, 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 it's not the flight path in this case, it's, the, it's where the, um, the walk took place. So it's, it's hub maps path. This is uh, some more detail inside of that inside of that facility. Uh, we can even see on the intensity values that there's some discoloration there on the floor. Uh, scanning to BIM, this is a new and exciting area that we're, um, uh, that we're working on and uh, uh, already starting to work with our distributors and, and some clients. So uh, going from these uh, very quick data acquisitions into 3D BIM models is a, uh, an exciting new feature that we're rolling out. A uh, beautiful scan of a home. Uh, again, the quality of the data, I think, speaks for itself. We can see the detail on the brickwork on the chimneys, uh, both of them, and uh, even the detail in the individu individual shingles on the top of the roof. All the different uh, lattice bars on, on the railing of the, of, of around the house, uh, the detail here was incredible. Um, yeah, some more. This was captured by our uh, distributors quantify in New York. Uh, so transport applications as well. So underneath the bridges are tricky places to fly drones because they are GPS denied. They, they can't see the sky very well. So HoverMap is given that position hold capability and um, imaging the, the underside of the bridge at the same time, keeping the drone safe from collision. These are the types of results that we can obtain in that type of environment. So walk are flying down the bridge. This is a bridge inspection um, of a bridge in Sydney. So on the, this case, we flew above and along and around and underneath that bridge. And you can see some of the detail, uh, those, uh, those, uh, the bolt uh, down in, in that sort of area and uh, just the level of detail that we're able to attain from this type of asset. A cross sectional view, but um, it looks like we're running kind of short on time, so I'm not sure how much is left in the slide deck. Um, oh, this is a, a train station in Sydney. Um, so I don't know if we can just go through the slides very quickly. Um, communication yeah, towers are, are, yep. Yeah, we can just through it quickly, yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, okay, so communication towers are also of, of high interest uh, for mapping and inspection, and it's a combination of both photo, uh, photographs or imaging with the LIDAR data.
So one of the things that we can uh, pull from this is also change detection. So if the angles of those panels have changed for some reason, uh, if we have uh, multiple scans, we can look for change detection in that type of um, asset as well. Uh, forestry is, a, is another one that's become quite um, of high interest recently. Um, it's being used in New Zealand and here in Queensland for those applications and, and being rolled out in other areas as well. Uh, the LIDAR's ability to penetrate the, the canopy and still obtain good ground returns helps with measuring the heights of the trees, but also it's can imaging the entire canopy all the way through, which also helps with um, measuring the diameter of individual trees or selected slots. So in this case, the canopy has been cut off and you can see the ability of HoverMap to obtain good information, good returns on each of the uh, tree trunks, which then uh, are able to be further analyzed by the people that are uh, managing that that plantation. Yep, so in this case, you can see all those dark points that are on the ground, those are the um, the ground returns, and then this is a walking scan. So again, it can be mounted to um, a quad bike, it can be flown, walked, and uh, depending on what your needs are as far as imaging that, that type of area. and they can be merged to have a more complete data set altogether. So very quickly, um, even the ferns in this image uh, turned out quite nice, I thought. So uh, with uh, Emerson's advanced autonomy, um, it actually was able to fly underneath this canopy and self-navigate between the trees and uh, image that, struck, or that, that area without um, fear of hitting the trees or flying into the canopy above it. Uh, this can be quite useful if, if the terrain is quite steep and it's difficult to walk or if it's uh, uh, impossible to drive. Um, again, uh, it's just some a nice high resolution imagery of, of that type of area. Uh, cultural heritage is another one that's um, of high interest, uh, preserving uh, information on, on buildings, especially if they're damaged. Uh, then the architects have a, a um, or the res restoration team have, you know, a, a very good copy of what was so that they can restore it and preserve it for future. Uh, this was a, a series of five scans that were merged into a single unified scan to create this model. You can see the detail in the uh, rock work. And uh, we talk about the versatility of hover map. Well, there it is mounted to a small uh, RC boat. And in this case, we can go under very low, low bridges or underneath docks and jetties and uh, those types of applications as well. Uh, this is at the Port of Brisbane. We were actually able to merge the uh, hub map data with side scan sonar data. So in this case, you can see the boat floating to the right hand side. We have all the top surface LIDAR point cloud from hub map and then merged it with the side scan sonar data, which gave us all of the, um, the piles for the jetty and the seafloor. And uh, Point cloud colorization, uh, HubMap is capable of doing this with a simple GoPro camera. And uh, I think the results uh, generally speak for themselves. Very, very high quality and uh, far less bleeding of color uh, than in other uh, other systems that I've seen in, in the past. Um, this is a building that we did in Brisbane recently. This, this uh, type of colorization can be used in so many different ways uh, from cinematography, uh, even just to um, uh, explaining what uh, to stakeholders, what they're looking at. So a lot of people get confused by all the different colors of, of the LiDAR point cloud, but when you put it back into true color, um, uh, everybody understands what they're looking at. This is a, a true color image of a rock wall feature on the ground. Um, in this case, lighting is critical. Uh, so if it's too dark, then the photographs uh, won't be able to, uh, to add any value. This is a, an asset, uh, a rock crusher facility, and uh, they wanted this uh, 
image for decommissioning. They want to tear this uh, asset down. And uh, this is helping the engineers understand what is existing there because that facility has been there for 20 years. And some of forest canopy. There could be some interesting questions asked about the health of that crop um, if the colors are changing. So in short, uh, safety, efficiency, uh, it's ease of use. I love that part about it. Uh, the versatility we've talked about, uh, it's able to um, access areas that are really not possible with other techniques. And uh, that reduces shadowing in, in many locations. And we often obtain a very high density and high detailed point cloud. So you can find out more by um, going to our website or emailing us at info at msint.io. Right. Um, and I guess the last thing to add there is that Emerson has an unbelievable um, Vimeo channel which is accessible there and we will share that after um, after the fact now. Um, on the conclusion of the presentation, I'd like to thank um, Jeremy and Peter for um, presenting that today. It's been fantastic to have you both um, here. But we do have a number of questions. But before we do get to the, the, the questions themselves, um, I just wanted to run a couple more polls um, that relate to the hover map. So the first, the, the first poll here is, um, what do you see as the key feature to hover map? The first one is mobility, ease of use, flexibility. The second one is point cloud, resolution, clarity, ability to merge multiple scans. And the fourth and last one there is able to use um, within GPS denied environments. So I'm just going to um, launch that poll. Um, and if you guys can get adding to that, that would be fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And uh, another poll question here is how important is being able to colorize the point cloud to you? So I'm just going to launch that um, right now. And I guess where, where this is going is this is going to go into, um, we're going to provide this information back to Emerson on the back of this webinar to really um, understand the audience that we've got today and what's what's very important to them. So um, obviously the, the, the fantastic thing about working closely with MSC is that we're able to provide them this um, happy feedback um, between the two organisations. So I'd like to thank everyone for submitting your poll question. Wait one more second um, for a couple more people to submit their poll um, questions. But um, again, throughout this webinar, we've we've gone through a lot and a range of different use cases. Um, and obviously, you can you can very much see the versatility of um, the Emerson Hover Map. Now. Um, if you do have any questions there, just feel free to submit them there in the right-hand side. Um, and I guess the, the last poll question is um, just to gauge the interest of the audience. So the, the last question is, would you be interested in, in a demonstration of the hover map system on your side or asset? I guess um, we, we will work very closely with them to make this happen um, if this is the case. So if you could please answer this poll, this will give us an understanding of whether you are interested um, in a potential um, demonstration on um, your assets or site. Even if you do not have an asset, um, we, we're more than likely to offer um, a demonstration um, for you. Wait for a couple more people to submit that poll question um, and then we'll get onto the questions for um, today. So I guess um, what I'll do is I'll address the Emerson team with a couple of questions that have um, come through in the last um, few moments and, and the first one here is in terms of operating temperatures and weather conditions I'm not too sure whether it's um, Peter or Jeremy that will answer this but in terms of um, what are the operating temperatures and weather conditions that the platform and the, the system can operate in or maybe an example of um, the extensive um, conditions that you've operated in. Yeah so um, hover map uh, the internal components of hover map are rated to 40 degrees uh, C uh, so we have operated hover map in, in much higher temperatures for short durations, but uh, there'd be a risk of, of overheating some of the components inside. It does do a fair good job of, of dissipating that heat, but uh, generally speaking, ambient outdoor temperature above 40 degrees C, it should be uh, very 
a very limited type of application um, to try to uh, take care of the hover map. Hover map's also been uh, well designed to try to minimize the inclusion of dust and um, water. That's very common in, in underground uh, mining environments. It's a very harsh environment. Sometimes even hypersaline water dripping from the backs. So in this case, uh, hover map has been designed to be robust in, in those types of areas. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's waterproof. I wouldn't hit it with a garden hose. Um, but it is it is a tough little unit, and uh, we have uh, seen incidents where uh, you know it's been mistreated, and uh, the the machine is still is still working happily. So um, I, I would say that it has an IP rating of maybe about four or five. But we have a new uh, version coming out uh, later this year that I believe is more like a, a six five, if I'm not mistaken. But don't don't quote me on that. But uh, we're working on improving the IP rating. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and I guess, are there any comments on the maintenance requirements? Are there any maintenance requirements on that? Generally speaking, no. HubMap is fairly maintenance free. Uh, we, we often recommend people keep the glass uh, uh, as clean as possible because obviously light is trying to go in and out of that glass on the Velodyne. Uh, we uh, uh, try to keep the, the body of the, the unit clean and the intake and the um, where the air is coming in and air is uh, being blown out uh, clean and, and free of uh, particles and, and obstructions. But generally speaking, no, there's no maintenance required. Uh, we've had them out in the field for years without um, even coming back for a, a calibration check. But uh, obviously, if people want to send them back on an annual basis for a calibration check, we're happy to do that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, in terms of process, processing software, um, is there one system that you guys use? I know you're developing your own platform um, there. Um, I guess there's been a few questions around um, filtering options and, and colorizing the point clouds. So I think you'll be interested to hear about what that process looks like on your end. Yeah, sure. So um, we have our own software package where we initially create the, the, the point cloud. And in that software package at the moment, we're um, able to merge multiple data sets. And we are um, very soon here, I mean, in the next week or so, uh, going to be able to do the colorization through our own uh, software package as well. Uh, that being said, uh, some of the cleaning, um, uh, we uh, often use a, a software package called Cloud Compare. It's, it's well known across the industry. It's open source, it's free to use, it's easy to learn, and a lot of uh, good filtering and cleaning tools within that software package. Then it becomes a never ending piece of string because there's so many different types of applications in remote sensing and in mapping and imaging. Uh, so cinematographers will use a different software package than, than surveyors. Mining uh, clients will use a different software package again. So what we focused on in this case is to be able to support those different packages, so that the, most of the main packages that are used in those industries, and um, um, ensuring that uh, our uh, point clouds can go into their packages uh, as seamlessly as possible. And then part of my job and responsibility is to work with those, uh, so those third-party software groups uh, to design and develop workflows for our clients to uh, be able to go from a data collection to deliverables as, as quickly and as easily as possible. Yeah, sure. And that, there's a, and that's that's unbelievable. That's great to hear that um, the software is being built on um, your side of things. That's great to hear. Um, in terms of flight time, this is one that came through earlier on in the conversation. Um, flight times on the M200 series at this point in time? So flight times are um, are really dependent on the weight of the system, and HubMap's already one of the lightest uh, UAV LiDAR systems in the world. Uh, that being said, we are working very hard to shed grams at any time that, or any opportunity we can, but that's an engineering challenge. Um, we're working on that. Uh, with the M210 and uh, the 1.8 kilo payload that HubMap currently is, we have a good 10 minutes of flight time. Um, uh, there's a bit of a safety margin on top of that, but we often say 10 minutes to, to people so that they don't try to push it too far. Um, in this case, uh, you'd be surprised how much data you actually can collect in 10 minutes. I mean, that 90 meter vertical slope was collected in five minutes. So uh, in underground applications, we haven't seen that 10 minutes is a limiting factor. And for the broad acre, um, large scale outdoor mapping missions, then, then we would probably use a, a bigger drone with a with a lot more flight time so uh an m2 or sorry the m600 series is looking at 20 minutes the m300 which is again uh, dji is uh, coming out with later um very soon i think this year uh you're looking at probably about a half an hour and then there are also these third party um uh, drone manufacturers that have these heavy lift copters uh, we're looking at 45 minutes to an hour as long as they have an a3 flight controller or a pix4d 
then uh, we should be able to integrate with that platform and then push out those flight times. Great, thank you. And just a reminder, we are running a webinar on the Matrice 300 um, tomorrow. So um, for those that are interested in learning more about that platform, feel free to join there. Um, a question's come through around the PIX, PX4 capability. How far off is that? Um, and what does that look like on the Emerson roadmap? Oh, that's that's um, that's a great question. I, I I'll be completely honest with you. I don't know how far off it is. I do know that we um, have been actively working on that for the last six or eight months, and um, uh, I know that we uh, just went to, through our last round of DARPA challenge with that type of capability. So we have that capability in house, but uh, it's um, I think it's at that point now where we're fine tuning it and uh, uh, trying to improve upon where we're at before it goes out to commercial release. Uh, you, you can imagine that for commercial release, it has to be near bulletproof. Uh, so we have a working version in-house and uh, I would expect uh, if all goes well, that uh, sometime later this year, that um, we would start to, to be able to integrate with those um, types of uh, flight controllers. Alrighty, fantastic. And I think what we'll do is we'll end the conversation there for today. And again, I'd like to thank um, you both for being here today. And on behalf of Sphere Drones and the audience, thank you very much, Jerry and Peter, for joining us. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thanks very much. And thanks to all the people who attended. Uh, appreciate your interest and uh, look forward to um, working with you guys. Please uh, let us know if you have any other questions. Uh, feel free to write us anytime. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, thank you again to Emerson and Stefan and the rest of the team there um, up in Queensland. So just uh, on the wrap up of this, uh, just a, wanted to go through a couple of upcoming webinars. Um, tomorrow, there's a, well, this evening, there's an announcement on the DJI Matrice 300 and tomorrow we'll be, um, we'll be handballing all your questions that you may have on the DJI Matrice 300 and H20 series payload, everything you need to know. Um, that's happening tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, next Thursday, we also have another webinar on water sampling at depths with drones and custom solutions. So some of the solutions that we've developed in, in alliance and collaboration with the likes of Sydney Water. Again, I'd like to thank um, the team at Emerson for presenting what they've had today. Um, it's been quite fantastic to see how uh, a system can map the inaccessible. Um, it's, it's amazing to see the, the wonders that they're working in the industries of mining, infrastructure, survey and mapping. Um, and if anyone does have any further questions about um, the solution itself, we are here to make and answer the questions that you may have. Again, thank you very much to the Hovermap team and it's a very, very exciting product and I look forward to supporting it in the future. Have a great afternoon and I wish you all the best um, on your day. So best of luck. Cheers. Thanks, Jeremy and Peter.